So far, we discussed monosaccharides and disaccharides. Now let's move on and talk about polysaccharides. So what exactly is a polysaccharide and what's the purpose of polysaccharides in nature? Well, a polysaccharide is basically a very large carbohydrate that consists of many, many individual monosaccharides which are connected by, O oh, glycosidic bonds. And the organisms in nature, including our own cells, use polysaccharides for one of two purposes. They either use polysaccharides as a form of storing energy, so we basically store glucose, as we'll see in just a moment, in the form we call glycogen, which is a polysaccharide. And whenever we want to form ATP molecules, we can break down glycogen into the individual glucose constituents, and then we can feed those glucose molecules into the metabolism cycle, glycolysis, to basically form ATP molecules. Now, certain organisms, such as plants, as we'll see in just a moment, also use polysaccharides to basically form structure, give the cell structure and protection. Now, those polysaccharides that consist entirely of the same identical type of monosaccharide, these polysaccharides are known as homopolymers. And this is what we're going to focus on in this lecture. We're going to begin by discussing glycogen, which is the major type of polysaccharide that exists in our own cells and other animal cells. And then we're going to move on and discuss starch as well as cellulose. So let's begin with glycogen. So inside our cells, we store glucose in the glycogen form. And glycogen is essentially a homopolymer. It's a polysaccharide that consists of glucose molecules. Now, there are two types of bonds within glycogen. We have the more common alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond and the less common alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond. Now, we call this an alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond because it's a bond that exists between carbon number one on one glucose molecule and carbon number four on the adjacent glucose molecule. Now, if we examine the stereochemistry of carbon number one, this will have an alpha arrangement of atoms. And what that means is we'll have an alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond. So remember, the alpha anomer means that this bond points in the opposite direction downward with respect to this bond here, which points upward. So this group points up and this bond here points downward. So I just erase the oxygen. So let's redraw that oxygen here. Okay. Now, as a result of the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds, these alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds basically give the glycogen a helical structure. So as a result of the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds, even though this looks like a linear molecule, glycogen is not actually a linear molecule. It looks like a helical structure. Now, notice we also have the alpha-1,6 uh, glycosidic bond. So about every 10 or so sugars, we're going to have this alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond, and these will be the branching points. These will cause branching along that helical structure. Now, we call this an alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond because it's between this first carbon and this carbon number six on the adjacent sugar molecule. And this, just like that one, is an alpha anomer. And so that means we have the alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond. So glycogen consists of glucose monomers linked via alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds in a helical fashion. So these alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and so forth, they basically create this helical structure. And the helical chain has these branching points every 10 or so units as a result of these alpha-1,6 glycosidic bonds. And together, this basically gives glycogen a very branched structure. Now, when we want to break down glycogen, we can easily break down glycogen because we have the proteins, the enzymes that are able to break down glycogen into the individual constituents, the glucose molecules. And then we can use the glucose molecules in the process of glycolysis and the Krebs cycle to basically 
form the ATP molecules, the energy molecules which are used by our cells. So even though glycogen is not directly used as the energy source, we transform glycogen into something that we can use as an energy source, namely the high energy adenosine triphosphate molecules. Now let's move on to starch. So if glycogen is the energy storage in animals and humans, starch is the energy storage in plants. So the most common polysaccharide in plants used for energy storage is starch. And unlike glycogen, which comes in one form, starch actually comes in two forms. We have a starch known as amylose and a starch known as amylopectin. Now amylose essentially consists of only one type of bond, the alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond. So amylose is an unbranched polysaccharide that consists of glucose monosaccharides connected via alpha 1,4 glycosidic bonds. So the only difference between amylose and glycogen is in amylose we don't have these alpha 1,6 glycosidic bonds. We only have these alpha 1,4 glycosidic acidic bond. So this is our example of amylose. Now again, because of the presence of these alpha 1,4 glycosidic bonds, the actual structure of starch will essentially be like a helical structure as a result of these alpha 1,4 glycosidic bonds. So even though in this diagram it looks like it's a linear molecule, it's not actually a linear molecule because if we redraw these molecules in their chair conformations, we're going to see this helical structure that is formed. Now, the other type of starch molecule is amylopectin. And amylopectin is essentially almost the same as glycogen. Because amylopectin, just like glycogen, contains the alpha 1,4 glycosidic bonds and the alpha 1,6 glycosidic bonds. The only difference between amylopectin and glycogen is that in amylopectin, these alpha 1,6 glycosidic bonds are less common. In glycogen, these appear every 10 or so units, but in starch, in amylopectin, they appear every 30 or so units. So amylopectin is a branched polysaccharide that consists of glucose monomers linked via alpha 1,4 linkages and branches connected via alpha 1,6 glycosidic bonds. And the branches occur every 30 or so units. So amylopectin is just like glycogen except it contains less of these branching points that we find in glycogen. Now inside our mouth we have the salivary glands and inside our small intestine or at least inside our body we have the pancreas that basically release the alpha amylase. So both of these glands release alpha amylase so salivary glands in our mouth and our pancreas produce the alpha amylase which are responsible for basically breaking down these bonds. And when we ingest the starch, the amylose and the amylopectin, this is the enzyme that is responsible for breaking down these bonds and forming those individual glucose molecules. Actually we form maltose and then maltose is broken down by maltase at the brush border of our small intestine as we discussed in the previous lecture. So glycogen is the polysaccharide that is used to store energy in animals, while starch is the polysaccharide that is used to store energy in plants. Now let's move on to cellulose. Cellulose is actually one of the most common types of organic compounds on earth. And cellulose is basically another very common type of polysaccharide that we'll find in plants. So cellulose, unlike starch and glycogen, plays a role in structure and we'll see why that's the case. It has to do with the type of bonds that exist in cellulose. So we saw that in glycogen, as well as starch, we have these bonds we call the alpha 1,4 glycosidic bonds and we said that these alpha 1,4 glycosidic bonds create a helical structure and the helical structure is perfect to store it as energy. On the other hand, in cellulose, 
we have individual monosaccharides of glucose that are connected via beta 1,4 glycosidic bonds. And as a result of these beta 1,4 glycosidic bonds, cellulose doesn't have a helical structure. Instead, it has a linear structure. So the beta 1,4 linkages allow cellulose to form very long straight chain linear fibers as shown in the following diagram. So unlike in this case and in this case where the structure actually looks like a helical structure, here it actually looks like a long linear straight chain fiber as a result of the conformation of the beta 1,4 glycosidic bond. So why is this 1,4 glycosidic bond? Well, because the bond is once again between carbon number one of one glucose and the fourth carbon of the adjacent glucose. But the arrangement, the orientation of this first carbon, the anomeric carbon, is the beta arrangement that means this bond points in the same direction up with respect to this bond and so this is precisely what gives it that long linear structure now as a result of the long linear structure many of these fibers can basically stack on top of one another and they can interact via hydrogen bonds and that can and, and that will give cellulose a very very strong nature so essentially many of these individual fibers of cellulose can stack on top of one another via hydrogen bonds and that gives it a very high tensile strength and that's exactly why cellulose is optimal it's used for providing structure protection as well as support to plant cells and we'll talk much more about cellulose in future lectures so we see that polysaccharides are used either to store energy and then convert that into ATP molecules as it happens inside our cells or they can be used in the form or they can be used to give the cell structure and protection as the case is with cellulose in plant cells now inside our body we do not have enzymes that can break down these beta 1 4 glycosidic bonds in cellulose but even though we can break down cellulose these types of polysaccharides are very important constituents of our diet because this is what we call dietary fiber cellulose is an insoluble fiber that we can ingest into our body and what it does is it aids in the process of digestion it speeds up the rate at which the food products basically move along our small and large intestine and what that means is it decreases the likelihood that we're going to actually ingest toxins into our body.